Uh, DeAndre Brutus. I really like Karen Winter. Okay, we are 100 percent and therefore four with the staff of step being stated. Uh, approval of the minutes on number three. I'm sorry, does everyone have an agenda? Great. So the approval of the minutes is going to be uh, deferred. I'll take the blame for that. Um, uh, I'm getting over, so if I took my head off the shoulder on the break, you would excuse me. So may I have a motion uh, to defer the minutes to the next one? Uh, I move to I moved, I motion to move next the approval of the meeting minutes from April 11th to 24 to our next meeting, which will take place on uh, June 12th. Uh, second? Second. Okay, it has been motioned by uh, oh, yeah. Council of Lewis and second by Council of Winters that we're going to Mother's Day. Um, it says to the world, you are mothers, but to your family, you are the world. So just we want to wish you a happy pre-Mother's Day. Um, so as you all know, we each serve a different role. Carmelita is our chairperson, DeAndre is our community engagement specialist, and I'm, I'm the nominator. And so we just had the daunting task of going through over a hundred <laughs> applications uh, looking for those special people who would serve on the permanent commi commission, community commission. And so we came up with our list of 14 plus one that we sent to uh, the mayor. And so I would just like to introduce their names to you. Um, so we have Aaron Gottlieb, and I believe he's from the north side. Then we have Aubrey Minor. She is our youth uh, from the south side. Then we have Angel, Ruby, Navario. I may be pronouncing his last name wrong. And he is our young person, and I think he's from the north side. Because we have to have two uh, representatives from the south side, two from the west side, two north side, and then one that we consider citywide. And then we have attorney Kelly Presley, and she is from the West Side. Then we have Sandra Wortham. She is also an attorney. She is from the South Side. We have Anthony Driver, who is the president of the Interim Commission, um, South Side. And then we have Ramel Terry, who was the vice president of the Interim Commission, and she is also um, from the West Side. And I believe maybe June or July, they'll be transitioning into their roles. June? Okay, so in June, they'll be transitioning into their roles and we're going to host like a meet and greet for our West Side representatives so we can get to know who they are and start putting the pressure on already. <laughs> That's for sure. And so then, okay, and so the other, another thing that we're supposed to do in the 15th district, in every district is create initiatives and this is also a daunting task and it's taking longer than we anticipated. I was hoping, you know, we would have come to something by now, but everything is still in development um, because it's a very new process. We're still trying to see now even how district counselors and commanders, they got to put a policy in place for, you know, what that looks like. But one of the, one of the initiatives and the aim is definitely about officer wellness. Um, but not just officer wellness, also community wellness. And so I'm trying to uh, work on doing something either like a Mindful Monday or uh, a Worry-Free Wednesday where we come together and do meditation, breathing, those things to help uh, regulate the central nervous system because we're all traumatized. Whether you, If you live in the community, work in the community, pass through the community, Anything can happen at any point throughout the day and it, it, it affects us, at least it does me. And so, um, yeah, we just want to come together as a, as a collective body and heal. To, we can hurt together, but it's time that we come together and start healing. So I've been in contact with Ms. Zelda Robinson and she does, mindful, she does mindfulness breakthrough system. Um, and we're hoping we can kick that into gear next month. Um, and so I think that's um, so I am uh, Counselor Rudis. Again, I am the engagement specialist for our group. 
I'm tasked with the development of relationship between police community, trying to figure out how to best go about that, making sure that we are all connected in the very best way. 15th does the best job in terms of community police relationships throughout any district in the city, and we really want to uphold that. And so some of the ways that we want to even we want to take that to a higher level is to make sure that the district council is also connecting with the DAC. And so to that end, some of the things that we have started to do with our DAC members, last month we partnered with the chair of the um, faith-based committee and we hosted a joint meeting. Essentially, we led our, our, our district councilor meeting and then uh, our, some of our members were able, or, or attendees, then attended their training session, which focused on community engagement uh, from a spiritual perspective. And so we want to make sure that we are collaborating in the same way that uh, we should be doing with that uh, the police department does. To that end, the next thing that we're going to do, went to our DAC meeting yesterday, and we looked at some of the hotspot areas in the community. One of the things we've done in the past was host job fairs right on site um, with the DCOs. We did this a couple times, and we are going to do that once again. So we're going to pick three hotspot areas. Uh, we're going to get some resources together in terms of jobs and things like that that work with justice involved people, bring some of those uh, organizations that have resources out as well as CPD, and we're going to make a joint effort with the DAC once again to sit on hot spots and bring positive attention as well as hopefully get some folks some jobs. Um, the other things that we uh, have been doing in terms of educating is holding Know Your Rights seminars quarterly. Uh, the last one we focused on the DNC and uh, the protest rights, but also getting folks to understand uh, pretrial fairness and how uh, things have been affected with that. And uh, some folks talked about wanting to learn a little bit more about uh, marijuana and how uh, your rights and, and what has changed mm -hmm. obviously since legalization. So that is something we look forward to as well as also potentially following up. And now that the DNC is closer and closer, trying to bring someone in that could talk about what, if you're going to protest, what that should look like. Uh, now that we know that it's in place. Hopefully we can have a representative from the DNC or somebody that's involved with that come out. And that quarterly meeting should take place in June. There is not a date yet. I still have to get a location. I know one of the folks with the marijuana is uh, available, but I have to find someone from DNC. So just that's a TBD for that one, but that will more than likely happen in June, if not July. Uh, the other thing that has happened more recently, I finished my ride along with uh, Officer Munoz there, uh, which was a really good experience. One of the things that we want to do is make sure that we are educated from all standpoints as it relates to uh, policing. So we got the chance to ride together for quite a few hours and just have conversation about uh, what this relationship looks like. So that was pretty cool. The last couple things that I will mention is that um, in order to stay abreast of what we got going on, we print a monthly newsletter. Every day, every month, we have a newsletter. Uh, I would like to bring your attention to the goals. So last month, we talked about some goals that we would like to set for our, for our time here as district counselors. Uh, one was to develop a protocol for police involved fatalities. Uh, we know that uh, recently in the 11th district, there has been a, um, a lot that has transpired and we want to make sure that we're a little bit more proactive <coughs> in terms of how that engagement might look as it relates to something like that happening in our district. Uh, also, we would like to conduct a monthly study group to analyze the consent degree documents. Um, so uh, today is the first day that at least we'll start to learn a little bit about it. But moving forward, we'll put something in place where folks can learn more about it. Next thing we want to do is to train our community members on how to review and add public comments to the general orders, which are the policies of the Chicago Police Department when that public comment period opens. A lot of folks don't know that they can actually uh, talk about uh, the general orders and those policies that uh, actually govern uh, the Chicago Police Department. So we wanna make sure that they are abreast of that. And last thing we would like to do is familiarize our attendees with their beat number, beat facilitators, and beat meeting locations. Again, making sure that there's a collaboration between a DAC. Uh, obviously, we have a role to uphold, but the, the uh, DAC does exist in those entities. Uh, in terms of CAPS exists as well, and we want to make sure that our community is abreast of that. 
And so you will have a newsletter that comes out every month. You will also have um, a resource list that we are compiling right now. We have things like uh, trespass affidavit, noise ordinance. I, at some point, I'm going to upload each one of these newsletters that has followed our meetings. I will also, if possible, upload the videos. That's another thing. Our meetings are typically recorded, except one we missed so far. But it's uploaded to YouTube, so folks that don't get a chance to vi uh, come to the meetings can always go on YouTube and watch the video. Very last thing I will say, two things that I'm working on with our data team is to one, geomap every location of the meetings that we've had so far and also look at the awards that we've had them in so that we can make sure we're touching every single ward uh, multiple times because we do move our meetings around. And we are also going to look at crime stats. Um, I would personally like to see um, some layering of our crime stats, but we're going to pare it down a little bit so that it's more digestible for community members so they can understand some of the going zones and some of the areas of the 15th district so they could be a little bit more knowledgeable. That's what we're working on with engagement. Outstanding. You know, it's kind of tough to follow on Dr. Dre, but however, <laughs> here in 15th district, let me first of all say that we don't normally um, Salute CPD. We appreciate you guys coming to the meeting. So can you sure. guys join us in a round of applause? Thank you. Thank you. We were told the commander was on furlough, but he uh, did some things that we're going to take credit to. <laughs> 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 and we appreciate that captain as well as Sergeant Patrasonis and of course uh, uh, Officer Munoz. We appreciate you being here, although in plain clothes. Here in the 15th district, we have a model that says 1-5 is unified. And that's one that we are very proud of. It's one that uh, uh, co-counselor uh, co uh, Winters uh, championed. And you know what? She set the bar, and we are definitely going to live up to it. We also have a mission statement that's quite comprehensive for you, the public. Uh, in about a couple workouts of our meetings, we had a, a work table discussion, and, the, and the, the community came up with that. So I'm your, I'm your chair. So what what's, that simply means is these people make my job very, very easy. I'm just to facilitate and ensure fostering environments of uh, compliance and, uh, and excellence. And therefore, having these two, they make me look good because I didn't know what the various meetings and things of that nature. In the back, you will see there's a white box that has been um, added to our purpose. Uh, you, the community, have told us that there are some concerns you have and you would like to do them anonymously and things of that nature. So that being stated, that's for CPD. Whatever you drop in that particular box will be forwarded to them before they leave so that you can have your community uh, concerns addressed. As a matter of fact, I have one to put in there myself. So that being stated, there's a little pop-up happening at uh, Long and Washington and uh, we're going to let them know that they need to go ahead and get some license and open up a dispensary because we're not going to have an open market. So that being stated, um, thank you for electing us uh, into this space. We're going to do whatever's necessary with your particular voice. You tell us what's needed. We're not wooden soldiers, but we will march. And that being stated, um, as your chair, I'm proud to be here. Peacock, proud to be here. And um, I, I'm done. My job is easy because they do the they do the, the heavy lifting. So next. You know what? I, I'm sorry. I just, that was just two things, last things that I wanted to mention. We do have a QR code right at the top of every newsletter as well. Um, there is a public safety survey that is included. It really helps us to keep track of the work that we're doing. We would obviously like to see some improvement at the end of these four years. And then the other thing is there is a contact us for those that would like to kind of, you know, just have conversation with us outside of dropping it into uh, this anonymous box over there that uh, Counselor Earls mentioned, you can also just reach out to us again here with this QR code. And that can also just be a contact if you would like newsletters and things like that. Outstanding. We're going to go to the um, next part. We're going to do a little deviation here. We keep our agenda kind of fluid so we can move with it. And at this point, I'm going to turn it in the hands of Counselor Rudis so he can take us further. All right. So every month, we've decided that um, we are going to select a community member that has made such an impact in whether it's public safety or uh, police accountability that they should be recognized. We typically call that individual our, uh, they get our legacy honor, if you will. And um, 
the other month, we select an officer that has, as we like to call it, gone above and beyond to really continue to serve the community. And um, that is the, net, the title of this particular award and that we will be presenting today to uh, Officer Munoz. And with that, I will read Officer Munoz's bio. And then we'll ask you to come up, you know, um, you want to give a speech, man? He's stressful. You can do that, but I mean, you know, otherwise, um, <laughs> otherwise, uh, we would, you know, give you your award and uh, send you on your way because I know you got to go. So here's the deal. Uh, Officer Jorge El Munoz started his career with the Chicago Police Department in September of 1992. He was first assigned to the 13th District, which was Wood Street, and he remained there until 1999 when he was transferred to the 25th District, which is Grand Central. In December of 2011, Officer Munoz began serving the Austin community, the community of Austin in the 15th District. Over the years, Officer <coughs> Munoz has served the citizens of Chicago as a beat patrol officer, a rapid response officer, a burglary team officer, and a robbery team officer. He is currently a trouble buildings officer and has worked extensively over the years in the CAPS program, connecting with the people and the neighborhoods in which he has served. Officer Munoz has a bachelor's degree in public safety management and a master's degree in public safety administration. Please uh, give it up for all of says. It says above and beyond. It says the heart of a leader manifests through service to others. This certificate of appreciation and grateful recognition of your continuing service and support, we hereby present Officer Jorge Munoz um, with this certificate of recognition for your service, leadership, and courage on behalf of the 15th District Council on this day of May 9th, 2024. All right. We'll go over there. Yeah, we'll come over there. Yeah, a little bit more space. Or you want to get more this space. in the background? More space. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. We'll do this. If, yeah, come on. It's the background. The backdrop. Sorry. Okay, I know. I'm teaching. He probably going to stand in the middle. Well, we'll turn it. Yeah, what's that? for your generosity, for your love, for your support. You know what? I've made lots of great friends, longtime friends since I've been here in the 15th District. I've had the privilege of working under uh, different commanders. And I, Commander, uh, Captain, Sergeant, thank you for allowing me to do what I do. The only reason I do what I do is because of our supervisors, our commander, our command staff. So I want to say thank you. Thank you for allowing me to, um, to show our potential to show our love, our concern, to show our our you know, how, how much we care for the for the Austin community, how much we care not only for the Austin community but also for our, our officers. Uh, we and we're not afraid here in the 15th district to show our genuine concern, our love, and our concern for for one another. So thank you very much. This, this means a lot. This is I'm very grateful. <laughs> but I do, before we before we go on, I do have to tell a story, though, quickly. So I did do my ride-along with Officer Munoz, and it was wee hours in the morning. I think I got up 5 o'clock in the morning. But at some point, as we were riding around, we, we pulled over for a moment, and there was a young lady who was stranded. And, you know, she walked up to the car, and she wanted to use one of our phones because she wanted to make a call. She needed someone to come and help her with the car and she thought she might have needed a jump. And Officer Munoz was like, well, you know, just give me a minute. And he went back to the station and he got um, a box, you know, jump box. And he went back, you know, to help her, you know, with her car. It wasn't, I don't think it was, she needed a battery, but 
I, I was like, this is what we don't see. You know what I'm saying? This is when, right. when they just go, because he didn't have to do that, right? But this is the part of policing that we don't see. We see what happened when, you know, community members want to go raise in hell and go ham on officers. And I wish the department would do a better job at showing those wonderful nuances that happen with officers and community, because maybe that could really begin to shift the, the sentiment and feelings right. towards our officers. You know, even though I was, I was an impacted family, I've never blamed every last single officer. I am not an abolitionist. I believe in this work that I do. And I believe that, I don't know what it would be if they weren't doing what they were doing, because we're not running to the fire, as they say. And so, and that's all. I just wish the department would show more Officer Munoz's stories and others like those. So to change the perception of officers, especially for our young people, they need to see that. So I just want to share that with my story. <laughs> all right. So, so uh, with that, um, one of the things that has come up when we do this particular award is that we keep giving to CAPS officers. It's, 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 we're, we're not trying to, I swear. But we would definitely like for uh, if either of you know your B officer and you know that they're doing some good work as a detective, attack officer, you know, anybody that you all know, even officers, if you all know somebody that's, that should be recommended, please let us know because we want to make sure that we highlight all of the officers and not the ones that are uh, community. <laughs> So uh, with that, we will now move to our next set, uh, agenda topic, which is the public comment criteria <clears throat> section. Uh, for public comment, uh, folks have two minutes to uh, speak how they'd like. Um, any concerns, please voice them um, so that the officers can notate it. If you would not like to, then just write it down and put it in our uh, anonymous box back there, and we'll pass the message on. Otherwise. Um, Folks can uh, speak freely at this moment. For two minutes. Two minutes. Well, now you got your two Yeah, Ms. Cassandra. Oh, okay. Uh, it was uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Cassandra Norman. I just wanted to speak to the point that the officers in the 15th District do uh, work really hard with the community, being a community resident. And I, I know for a fact that Officer Munoz's name, Officer Munoz is a celebrity in the 15th District uh, in terms of abandoned buildings, uh, uh, using his tools or doing whatever he can to help the community. So I just wanted to kind of co-sign that award yeah. as an, a, a resident of the community and a former co-worker of uh, Officer right. Munoz. I live in Austin, so I know. They said, well, you know, we're going to call Officer Munoz. He can take care of it. <laughs> I'm like, well, another officer can take care of it, too. But, you know, you, you're the celebrity here in Austin. Thank you very much. <laughs> and we appreciate all of the officers in the 15th District. We've been engaging with a lot of new officers it, it does turn over, however, uh, I think it passed the torch. That's all I'm just going to say. Yeah. Pass the torch to some of the younger ones so that they can watch and see what you do and do the same. Thank you. Well, yeah, thank you. That's yeah. all I wanted to say. Copy that. Any other comments? Can we have someone from the police department speak about what you would like from your community? <coughs> to make your job more First of all, I'd like everyone, thank everybody for being here. Uh, the first thing I'd like to see from our community is what we're seeing right now. We're all here engaged. We are educating ourselves about the consent decree. We are, uh, we have many different, different ideas, different backgrounds, different life experiences in the room, and we can agree mostly, and sometimes we can disagree, but we don't have to uh, fall out we can sometimes uh, agree to disagree. So that's the biggest thing. Uh, engagement, the engagement is always key. Now, um, just the other day, I, I saw an officer single-handedly push a vehicle about a block down Madison Street, uh, right off of Central, in order to get a car on the side of the road. Uh, officers do this every single day, millions of times. Not 
just in the city finality of most police, they're never going to say, ooh, ooh, ooh. They're going to go out about their day because it's a calling, it's a belief. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's something that, um, it's just how they feel, it's how they are inside. And if I, and if I called uh, Sarge out or Captain out on something that they did, they would say, hey, don't you do that to me. We're embarrassed by the accolades. But, but so, so that incident that, that you observed, please write a letter for like uh, Officer Munoz. Tell your friends is the most important thing you can do because you speak to so many different circles. People look up to you. You are an elected representative. The more you speak to what Officer Munoz is doing, to what 15 is doing, that's gonna go a long, long way into changing the hearts and minds of our community, right? Because I'm from the community myself. Um, so, so that's just it. We, you know, we, we don't want credit. We, we just don't want. We don't want prejudgment. Just like people of color, we don't want to prejudge when people look at us. Well, police of color, we don't want to be prejudged. You don't want to be prejudged as the district councilman. You don't want anyone saying, "Hey, this is what politicians do," and then no. We just want to be accepted and understood as people who are willing to run into the fire, run into the fight, and give all, and give our lives just for the honor of wearing the star and wearing the uniform and asking for nothing in return other than respect. So we just don't want to be lumped into situations that happen in other districts where the facts are not all always known, the investigation is all, not always done, and to have conclusions drawn. Because those conclusions, those statements are damaging. You know, people go home feeling a certain kind of way about it. Neighbors look at you a certain way about it. And, and, and the damage, it's, it's easy to inflict and it's hard to undo. But all in all, I'm proud, I'm honored to be here with you. I've been here approximately eight months. Uh, Austin has embraced me as a commander. Uh, I, I have not been mistreated at all. I've been welcomed as a son of Austin. You and I have talked many, many, many times. I've talked to all of you many, many times. We've done roll calls together. You guys have come out and done roll calls with me. So, you know, I just feel honored and grateful to be here. And I'm going to let the captain and the sergeant and, and, and Officer Munoz speak. Uh, but, but all in all, you know, we're just here to serve. And I think that uh, we try our best in order to do that. Thank you. I think, um, you know, as far as what um, we would like to see you know, with the community, I think a lot of it is just, um, you know, kind of going off what the commander said. Um, there is officers out here doing doing this stuff every single day, you know, and a lot of times I'm like, Officer Munoz didn't, didn't think twice, oh, can I do this or no, he just did it because that woman needed help. You know, that happens all the time where our officers just react, you know, based, a lot of it's based on our training to just react and, and, and help this person, you know, so step right in there and start, you know, unfortunately, we, you know, we get shooting victims here. We have a lot of our officers that will put a tourniquet on, you know, through their training and have saved, saved people. And, you know, that, that extra time that they took, you know, through their training to help someone, you know, was able to give that person that medical treatment before the licensed medical people got there and got them to the hospital. And that's something that we've seen, I think we've had an officer put a turn on last week. So it's just that that happens every single day. Um, and it's not something that, you know, we would put out there, but we do have, you know, there is a 15th uh, District Instagram page. Um, CAPS does put a lot of different things out there that the community is available to see. That does show this, these little things. It does show the basketball games that are going on, you know, on every one every Tuesday. It does show the different little parties that we have with the community and our community room or that our, our people are going out to. Um, so there, there, there's a lot of, lot of different things going on. And, um, you know, fortunately, just in everybody's lives, as busy as everyone is, a lot of times you don't get to see that, that those things. But they are happening, um, especially in this district. It's, it's happening every day. And um, our job as the command staff um, is the commander and I, we, we address a lot of roll calls. And what we do is we have a lot of young officers explaining, you know, when new policies come out. This is why, you know, it's important that you act this way. This is when you're on a crime scene. This is why, you know, when someone comes up to see what's going on, you know, they're, they're just, they just want to know what happened. I mean, of course, we can't tell the specifics of, the, of um, you know, whatever just happened, but we can, you know, let them know, hey, listen, unfortunately, someone got shot or whatever. Just the way that we deal with someone on scene can, can really have a, a huge impact on how the community feels about the police. And the community understands that, you, okay, well, I don't understand, I live here, but you know, it's unfortunately something happened here. I understand that I maybe have to use my back door and do this. You know, but if we tell them in a very polite, professional way, that, that goes you know, miles. So that, that's our job as supervisors, is to really kind of hammer that down to the young officers and realize that 
Um, you know, another, another example is unfortunately we had that um, that murder at the Family Dollar, the robbery. Um, you know, we were all over the community trying to get information, and we had um, some of our officers were, you know, just in the area, and we had somebody come up to them in Chicago Avenue and give them some information, and we immediately got to the detectives. And then, I mean, the, the turnaround on that case, the investigation based on information from the community, based on us working with the community, us working with the detectives, you know, that person was taken into custody and charged within, I think, two days, two or three days. So that's, mm -hmm. that's a huge thing. When you have someone, you know, running around with a, a machine gun, you know, obviously the police are involved right away. You know, and it's, it's just, thank God nothing else happened. Um, thank God nothing happened in Dalton when that in, interaction happened. You know, nobody had a shot out there, unfortunately. <laughs> or shots fired, you know, at the police. And it's just, um, there's a lot of these things happen, but our job is, as a supervisor, that, that we all kind of hammer down to the younger officers, being a young district, is, you know, every interaction that you have with the community means something. Okay? I mean, it may be something that's, you know, really quick to you, you're already arriving on the scene, a lot of people are yelling or whatever, but the way you carry yourself means something. And we're, we're trying to, to get that so that, you know, we're trying to build that bridge because it doesn't take much, doesn't take too much for that bridge to collapse. It takes a lot to build it back. So what we've been doing in Austin is we've been building that bridge, and it's it's, it's been a pretty, pretty strong bridge um, since uh, since we've been here. I've been here since uh, last June, not too a couple months before the commander, and it's it's been a great place to work. Really uh, I got here in August. You know, the superintendent has his philosophy, uh, and, and which speaks to the consent decrees. Every police officer is a community policing officer, and and that's something that we uphold in the Austin community. And like like the captain said, we speak about it every day at roll call. And you know these are young officers, uh, but as they get older and they have more life experiences, you know if you see the development over time, you see the maturation process. It's a lot to ask of them at such a young age. I remember being a young officer, um, but as time goes on, you know we're just going to see greater and greater continuous development, continuous partnership and continuous relationship that we have with the uh, officers and with the community as well. Thank you. Mm -hmm. so, Sure. I just want to say, you know what? Uh, right back at you. The love that in this room, the the concern, the the mutual um, friendships that we've developed. I've developed lots of friendships here in the 15th district that um, go outside of uh, of my work. You know, instead of passing on my CPD phone, guess what? To my friends now, I pass on my personal cell phone. So let's continue to be you know, an example. Let's continue to not just talk, but let's, you know, let's, let's be about it. Let's, let's do it. Let's continue to do what we're doing. So thank you very much for, for promoting the Austin community, for promoting uh, to the rest of the city how we work together, <clears throat> and how we get along, you know, how we problem solve, how we strategize. And uh, it is our responsibility to mentor the next generation, passing the torch. You, you, we're on it, you know. We're working on on motivating and encouraging and and protecting our next generation because they are they're going to be our future leaders. Right. They're going to be they're going to be the next uh, command staff, the next supervisors. <coughs> so my my years are, are you know they're getting um, I'm almost done. <laughs> yeah, they, you know, it's, uh, uh, nine more years for me, but but. Uh, uh, I'm not, I'm not counting. but we, it, it is a great responsibility and we need to take it uh, very, very seriously. And as you can see, we do. So uh, again, it was a pleasure right, uh, going on right along. Uh, one of the things that I recommend, we need to do more of that. Uh, and, 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 and I hope you choose Officer Munoz. Just, you know, you know, hope you, uh, I hope you select Officer Munoz with your ride along. Uh, but I highly recommend it for you all to, you know, you, you all should consider uh, going on a ride along. And honestly, I, I am biased. Uh, you need to do it in the 15th. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, before we go on, can we give the district council a person to hand? Yeah. yeah. I'm a big proponent of democracy. I see it nearly everywhere I go. Uh, it's an experiment, and it's something that we take for granted, and we can lose it if we don't do what we're doing now, which is exercising our right to be heard and to call our government, our political figures as well, uh, to the carpet. And, and also for that awesome food spread over there. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm glad to give you guys a big hand. Before, before, I just want to tell you something that's big to me. I actually witnessed a call on the uh, 
500 block of Leclerc. Yes. Tuesday. Tuesday. Today's what, Thursday? Mm -hmm. Thursday. Yesterday, yeah. Wednesday. Yeah. Um, Two officers came. I, I was on the other side of the street. But I was cutting some grass in the building. And um, if I was them, I'd have had a little different. So it's a good thing I had a fire department uniform and not a police officer uniform because it would not have made you look good. The man was very, um, he was very unprofessional and polite, very disrespectful, very profane. And your two guys took it like a champ. There are so many things, and I don't know your laws and SOPs, but I could have come up with some things, conduct on becoming, uh, <laughs> you name it. I, I, I'm serious, and then for them to be so close in the in the personal space. But I will find out who they were, and I will write that. Thank you. Because that's something Thank that I, I saw, and I was like, I was angered from Thank across the street. Thank you. Uh, this is post-COVID, but I don't need you this uh, post -COVID. Yeah. My <laughs> Hello, <laughs> especially saying what you say. So what they did, they mitigated the situation. The girlfriend was domestic. The girlfriend was there being irate. She was threatening the older people in the home, and uh, they made her leave. They did not leave until she left. And then the boyfriend who called them turned on them. I wanted to go whoop his butt. <laughs> but, but I'm just letting you know. I will find out who did that. I'm convicted, I will, and I will pick up my pen from here on out. Thank you. All right, thank you all. Uh, before I move on, any other public comments? All right, we will move on with the process. Uh, I would like Bedell to come on up and just tell us a little bit about the Good Neighbor Campaign. Okay, thank you. I can do this here, boo. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, all right, all right. Good evening, everybody. Um, I'm sort of the host tonight. Uh, and, and our space, PI, uh, West Side Health, the Neighbor Campaign. I passed out some handouts. If y'all want to read along, but I'm just going to read uh, what we do. I can say what we do too, but I'm going to follow the script today. All right. Uh, the Good Neighbor Campaign is a community-based movement that encourages people to take actions that will positively contribute to the neighborhood. The campaign encourages students to introduce themselves to, or residents introduce themselves to uh, neighbors and take responsibility for keeping sidewalks accessible, being conscientious and respectful by keeping noise low and keeping property in good condition. The West Side Health Authority's Good Neighbor Campaign is a community-based movement that connects neighbors, empowering us to share our abilities and talents with one another in order to realize a shared vision of a healthy, loving and supportive community. Good Neighbors is a non-profit organization that provides financial support to enable collaboration between USC faculty and uh, staff and local non-profit organizations that have a visible positive impact on neighborhoods surrounding uh, Chicago, West Side. But also uh, me as an outreach, I'm a black club organizer. I work with uh, Angelica. Mm -hmm. uh, we get a lot of blocks this year. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we do outreach in the community. Uh, we do a lot of work with seniors, uh, youth, uh, employment, uh, legal uh, assistance like expungement or things of that nature. So I'm out here doing this work. And then we work with 15 uh, the CPD uh, with mobilization. The art responders, right? Right. So, yeah, art. Yeah, we always on the scene when needed. So we right in there with you guys to every step of the way. Sometimes we almost feel like we police. <laughs> we work with the cops, we you don't know, do arrest and all that, but we right there uh, in need of uh, community, uh, you know, work. So hopefully that gives an idea of what we do. And we always here to join in on what's needed in the community, right? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So now we will go ahead and move to our guest speakers, which is our uh, consent decree uh, led by uh, Independent Monitor Maggie Hickey. Hi, um, thank you all very much for having me here today. Thank you for inviting me. And I will just say, I've been the monitor for five years. I've spent a, a fair amount of time here in the 15th district. And I will say that it is one of the most welcoming, at least to us as the monitor of the consent decree, um, both the community 
and the um, you know police district themselves have been terrific. I've been uh, at the Austin Power 5K. Um, I will admit I did not run. I found a nice set of older ladies, and I walked with them in the back. <laughs> um, and and um, I've been out to baseball games and light the night and other really impressive um, just community activities. And it's wonderful to see the, the community engagement that exists, you know, between CPD and I wish all of the districts could be like 15. It, it is really just, um, you know, your meetings are fabulous. You last year your district meeting the the um, the fellowship, the friendship, the kinship, the family it is is really impressive. And, and I go to all the districts, and, and so I just wanted to share that with you and that you guys do that you have something special. And so I wish that you could replicate that across the state. As the commander says, and the superintendent, I've heard them say this so many times, Every his, his aspiration is that every officer is a community officer. And I do really think in 15, every officer is a community officer. And that's part of why you guys are different. And another part is you have just a community that really is engaged and cares about their neighbors. Mm -hmm. And so it's a wonderful partnership. I want you guys to keep it up. I want to replicate it and, and see that replication across all 22 districts I think that um, we, we might see uh, a lot more movement on the consent decree a lot of a change in community sentiment do you know what I mean? and when you change that community sentiment and community trust then you get people you not you get anonymous tips you get people that call in you get people that write in and then cell rates go up and then crime goes down and so how does it you know what I mean it, it all does work together and you guys are on the right track, and, and I, I applaud all of you, and not just Officer Munoz, who's the rock star. <laughs> and he looks like a rock star today. Yeah. But so, um, my name is Maggie Hickey. I am the independent monitor. I work with um, uh, many different experts that help me monitor, and I have three people here with me today. I'd like to introduce them and have them say a little bit about themselves, because just like all of you, I, I, I get the credit, but I am, I'm the manager at the top that, you know, is working to make sure everything gets done, but these are the people that work with me on a daily basis. I will tell you, it's none of our full-time jobs. We all have jobs probably just like all of you here. I always mm. joke, I, I spend a lot of time, and I see Array well, a lot, you know, mm. and I say to her, 17 jobs what's your day job again and and so we're always talking about it she has a great synergy with all she that she does and um, so uh, Laura Kennard is our project director she keeps me in line and the project itself um, Joe Horak and Nora Ramos are um, part of our community engagement team and I will just tell you and um, they're all Dr. Kennard, Dr. Horath, and Dr. Ramos. And so they'll tell you each about themselves, about their day jobs, and then the job that they do with the consent decree. So, Laura. Hello, everyone. Hi. I'm Laura Kennard. Uh, I serve, uh, as Maggie mentioned, as the project director overseeing the monitoring team and trying to keep all the trains running on time. Um, I'm a criminologist. I've been working in police reform across the country um, for about 25 years. Um, quite a long time, um, and I also serve as an associate monitor on the consent decree independent monitoring team overseeing the Albuquerque, New Mexico consent decree, and I've been doing that work for almost a decade. So, very happy to be working here in my home city of Chicago. Joe. All right. Hi, everyone. I'm Joe Horath. I'm director of the Institute for Policy and Civic Engagement in the College of Urban Planning and Public Affairs. And what do I do? Well, uh, our institute does three things. Research on the science and practice of civic engagement, science and art, I guess you could say. Uh, we design and lead public engagement, so we help um, any kind of organization or community that wants to pull people together in public dialogue or public discourse. And uh, we do public education around policy processes, how things work. And so while we're, we're experts on engagement, we really think that um, that science, that expertise can be applied in all kinds of contexts. Mm -hmm. So I'm not a criminologist, but I do know a lot about data. <laughs> and I know about how we think about processes and how um, to translate information that we learn and put it into good use and, and practice. I'll turn it over to my colleague, Norma, who works with me. 
Hello everyone, I'm Norma Ramos. I'm the Associate Director at the Institute for Policy and Civic Engagement, as Joe mentioned, at UIC. I've been at UIC since the Institute was founded in 2008. And so um, I think you just shared the three buckets that um, we, we uh, our, our mission work at, at the Institute and sort of, I guess my position in that is like, I'm more, he's the data, data science person, I'm the engagement person. And so I'm always thinking about engagement methods in particular, various engagement methods in terms of helping participatory democracy, so yay, <laughs> um, and thinking about how we can get the community engaged in the public policy making processes, also just lifting voice up, having also thinking about language, language is really important when we're trying to like think about, you know, not making it too academic, right, what does this mean for my sister, my brother, other people in my family and community, and so I'm always thinking about it from those perspectives as well, and so um, help a lot with the programming, engagement methods, um, also research side, I teach, um, yeah, lots going on, so thank you. And I want to just add, our role is we're members of, uh, I guess kind of a subcommittee within the monitoring team called the Community Engagement Team. Uh, we, we do, as Maggie's probably about to talk about, uh, a big survey every other year as required by the consent decree. Uh, but we also do focus groups, meetings with anyone who wants to meet with us or meet with the monitor, um, and really just try to help facilitate the flow of information to way, you know, from community, from the monitor. Well, and I guess I should say a little bit about myself. I just said my name, but my name is Maggie Hickey. I was appointed the monitor five years ago. I'm a partner at a law firm called Aaron um, Fox Schiff. We merged, so I always I, was, I came from the shift side, so I always forget to say the first names of the firm. We call it AFS, but it's Aaron Fox Schiff. It's a, a national law firm. I was the head of our complex litigation and our white collar government investigations groups across the nation. Um, I was a federal prosecutor for 12 years. I rotated through the office and finished as the executive. Um, uh, assistant U.S. Attorney, the number three in the office, and at one point in my career, I headed up Project Safe Neighborhood for um, the U.S. Attorney's Office, and um, that is where I met Dr. Kennard. I don't think she was a doctor then; she was the grad student. I was a young, um, a young. I don't know that I was ever young, but I was. Uh, you were young. I was young once. You were um, young <laughs> at the U.S. Attorney's Office, and. You know, Project Safe Neighborhood was something very important to me and near and dear to the heart. And when I first started to go out to the communities doing the um, uh, meetings where um, we met with people that were coming back to their communities after having been in jail for gun crimes and talking to them about not only um, uh, what would happen if they picked up again, again, but here's all the services that are available to you and here are job opportunities and here are other things. And um, really it was that work when the consent decree came into being, um, a large part because of the community members like um, Arewa who worked with the coalition and filed lawsuits and got the Department of Justice to come in and do an investigation. And after that then there was a lawsuit that was filed by the state attorney general because of politics at the time. Normally the, um, the uh, US attorney general comes in but they didn't and the uh, state attorney general stood in the shoes of the Department of Justice and sued the city and came up with a settlement agreement and that's what we talk about but because um, anti-violence was always something that was super important to me and I was working um, at the law firm I had only just started at the law firm I had been there six months I had been at the US Attorney's Office for a very long time 13 years and then after that I was the inspector general for the state of Illinois for a number of years and I had just come to the firm and um, I was doing you know um, investigation type work for large corporations and things like that and when everybody asks me how did you um, become the monitor and I said, I read about it in the Daily Law Bulletin. <laughs> and there was a request for um, for RFI, or RFP, RFP, RFP. Um, to apply. I knew the consent decree was coming, we had been talking, and, and I'd been thinking about it, and you know the importance that it was gonna be to the city of Chicago. <coughs> but I didn't really focus on you know who was gonna be the monitor. And I saw the RFP, and I thought, heck, I think I could do that. And yeah. you know what? I don't know that I really like this 
traditional law firm stuff. I, I like this. I like being in the community. I like yeah. working with law enforcement. This is something interesting. So I thought about it, and I was thinking about putting together a team. And Dr. Kennard called me, and she worked with um, her company CNA, which is a nonprofit that provides, um, you know, um, exactly what. I was like training, training, and, technical training and technical assistance. And she called me and she said, you know, I was thinking about putting in for that, but I think you should head it up. And I'm like, interesting, that was what I was thinking. <laughs> and I was wondering though how I was gonna do it. Oh, yeah. And so yeah. Laura yeah. was so fabulous. She's like, well, here's how we can do it. And so it tells you the synergies that yeah. we met probably maybe even in the 15th district, I wondered, one, of, one of the PSN. Are you guys still a PSN, PSN district? district? Yes. It was one of the PSN yeah. districts. Yeah. And, and so we that had, a lot of time so it, it comes full circles. That was 20 something years ago. We met at a oh, PSN. Do math. I know, don't do that. Don't we do met math. at a PSN meeting and, and that's kind of, I, I just thought I'd share, you guys have been so wonderful sharing about yourselves yeah. and about how we ended up becoming the monitors. I grew up in Chicago. I grew up in the Ninth District. I grew up in the Pilsen, Bridgeport area, um, and you know Chicago is very important and near and dear to me. So I tell you that just so you know who we are a little bit. Now I'll talk to you about the consent decree. Okay. Um, my slides didn't work anyway. So, but okay. I have I have I have a handout here yeah. that are the slides. This way you can take notes or take them home and look at them. But you know we talked about how the consent decree came to be. But what is a consent decree? As I said, it's really just. A little document and it's a settlement agreement between the city and the state attorney general that requires changes to CPD's policies and practices to improve policing for everyone in Chicago. There are 11 areas, focus areas of the consent decree. I won't read them, you can look right here at them. I'll just describe to you then a little bit about more about my team. So you, there's no way that I could do this myself. So the consent decree is, um, it was originally had 10 um, kind of focus areas, but an 11th was added about a year ago, and the 11th is investigatory stops, protective pat downs, and um, enforcement of law loitering ordinances. So I have an associate monitor that oversees each of those areas, and they are subject matter er experts in those areas because I, I tease. I, I'm a uh, jack of all trades, master of none. I think the old adage goes um, slowly but surely, I'm learning a lot as it goes by, but um, I have really um, terrific people that assist me and help me. And we have lawyers from our law firm and analysts from Dr. Kennard's um, office that then support those um, monitors. Um, I have a wonderful deputy monitor, uh, Rodney Monroe, who's the former police chief of Charlotte, North Carolina, been the police chief in Richmond and Washington, D.C. too. Um, I have a senior associate monitor that's also the monitor for training and um, recruitment and hiring, who is a former police chief from Texas. Um, he supports is the, the, one of the former commissioners from Boston. Um, and then in like crisis um, intervention, I thought of um, uh, Carmelita, what you were talking about, how you admired those police officers. That's because they have had de-escalation training. And or it might have been a CIT officer if it was um, you know, a domestic. And those um, are CIT, we have a wonderful person who has a master's in social work that is um, on my associate monitor that oversees that. Of course, for data, we have a PhD. Um, who is a data analytics because of course I'm very proud that I get my computer up and running every day <laughs> and, and my systems and everything else. So I just want you to know that I don't do this job alone. I do this job with subject matter experts that um, work with myself. Um, we work with the Attorney General and the city and the coalition, which is um, uh, the coalition is, I should let Arewa tell you. So why, Arewa, why don't you tell them who the coalition is? So the coalition was actually two groups that both filed lawsuits. Uh, and so when the, uh, Lisa Madigan filed her lawsuit, well, I know Campbell was like, you know, we want to be in, a, in that, a part of that. And so they formed as a coalition. So Campbell plaintiffs was Black Lives Matter Chicago, NAACP, the Chicago Urban League, Network 49, uh, Justice for Families, the 411 Movement for Pia Lori, and I think Brighton Park Network, but they kind of pulled away. Mm -hmm. And then um, for Communities United, what, um, the ACLU, One North Side, Communities United, 
and I'm leaving one out. It's always a nice one. one. But we, we are collectively made the consent decree coalition. And so the coalition, um, while they are not parties to the consent decree, they do have special rights and they have enforcement rights in, um, with the consent decree. And um, I meet with them quarterly, but I meet with you guys way more, way more often than that. I was on a call with the coalition yesterday and, and they are a community voice. But what is wonderful now about having, I'll just, I always call it the commission. I know you got all those letters that go with it, um, but the commission provides another community voice. And so I'm really trying to get out to every um, district council meeting to talk about the consent decree and then um, because I think it's another layer of community voice. So it's very important. And so the consent decree is overseen by a federal judge and it's really a settlement agreement. And the, it was approved by uh, federal judge Robert Dow, but he has since left the Northern District of Illinois and now it is enforced by Chief Judge Rebecca Pallmeyer. And um, the consent decree doesn't just oversee CPD. Sometimes people think it's the CPD consent decree, but it's not. It's a consent decree over certain parts of the city of Chicago. So the consent decree oversees um, the CPD, COPA, the OEMC, Office of Inspector General, and the police board. For narrow aspects, we don't, mm -hmm. it, it wouldn't be humanly possible <laughs> to, to, that we monitor everything. But the main group and the largest paragraphs in the consent decree is regarding the CPD. The consent decree, which I described as a settlement agreement, is voluminous. It was originally 799 paragraphs, 299 pages. Um, now with the addition of the stipulation regarding um, investigatory stops, it's about 886 paragraphs. About, it is, it is like 500 and something of those that are, um, 500 plus, it might be up to 600 plus, that are monitorable. Um, one of the things that I wanted to tell you is we have a website, cpdmonitoringteam.com, and I just want to say, Officer Munoz, congratulations, and if you have to leave, I will not be offended. So please don't. I can see him, I'm like, please don't, please don't. I, I promise, that next time I do a ride along, I'll call you. Okay. Thank you. Um, and so there are over 600 paragraphs that are monitorable. And so how do we determine the city's compliance? Um, we divided up the compliance with the consent decree into three levels, preliminary compliance, secondary compliance, and full compliance. Um, and this doesn't apply to every single paragraph, because some are unique, but we look at it as um, preliminary compliance. Does CPD have the right policies? Do they have the best practices? Are they looking across the nation and recognizing that Chicago is different, do you know what I mean? So they may have to be tweaked or other things, but are they following best practices? Then after that, for secondary compliance, now they have the best practices and the best policy they can have. Are they training the officers properly on those um, policies? And then they don't reach full or operational compliance until are those policies and trainings working? And are you all feeling it in the community? Are you being police different? Are you seeing de-escalation? Are you seeing a community policing officer, you know, helping somebody out and not just ignoring them? So operational compliance is truly when these new policies are working in the community. Oh, it looks like two things. So you've met, um, we have additional people on our community engagement team. As I was describing, I won't tell you everybody's names, they're not here, but we have other people that work with us. Um, and specifically, um, Steve Rickman, who's our associate monitor for community policing, and Denise Rodriguez is our associate monitor for impartial policing. And those are you know, really important parts of the consent decree, along with officer wellness and, and so many. It's hard to say what's the most important part of the consent decree. And sometimes, truly, you know, I think the one that the community doesn't talk about that is but is one of the most important, I think that the commander, since we have a pair out, uh, is most important is supervision. That is probably one of the most important parts of the consent decree because if you can get unity of command span of control, um, you will find that people will police differently. And I see him nodding, so at least I got that right. Supervision and staffing. And staffing, oh, 
staffing is very important because you could only have that unity of command span of control which is the idea of having um, 10 officers to one sergeant if you have the staffing and I will say very important and I'm not really following my slides as much as I normally could because you guys are a nice friendly group so I can just talk with you all um, there is a workforce allocation study mm -hmm. that is being undertaken right now. There was an RFP mm -hmm. out for it, or an RFI, and I think that they are working with um, an organization that is going to conduct a year-long study regarding work workforce allocation and, and where should the officers be working, you know, different sections and teams, and do they have enough? and um, if not what do they need to adequately and so that we have really pushed for over the last couple of years because we think it's so very important because cpd is very understaffed at the moment mm -hmm. and it also will take into account is should there be additional civilians also that work for cpd and that they could do certain jobs and then put law enforcement officers into other mm -hmm. jobs that would push them back out into the community doing the jobs that you all want to see them do um, so, um, what do we do? I described to you how we monitor that, but we do two reports a year. There are, I call them semesters because I have kids still in school, but there are two reporting periods per year. And um, originally they were kind of off and they were from March to, I don't know, six months out. But now because of after COVID, there was um, an extended time period, so now we are on the calendar year. So we are currently right now in Independent Monitoring Report 10, um, IMR 10. I joked that when I first took this job, I'm like, how will I ever learn all the acronyms? And then I made a whole bunch of myself. I became the, I, my team became the IMT, the Independent Monitoring Team. Our reports became the IMRs, the Independent Monitoring Reports. So we are currently in reporting period 10. We are working on our report for IMR 9, which should be out at, at, towards the end of the month. So the statistics that are here in this packet are from Independent Monitoring Report 8. If you go to our website, and Laura says I have to say it three times in my presentation, cpdmonitoringteam.com, so I said it twice, and it's on the paperwork here too, um, that we have all of the reports are there, and so you can read them and review them. They are very voluminous. We have worked. Um, IMR 8 was probably the first one that was a little shorter. We do a summary, and it has about 188 pages with appendices. The prior reports um, had gotten very voluminous at like, or Ray would know it's because she has attempted to read through them a thousand pages. And, and so they, they are very, because if you're reporting on 600 and something paragraphs, every, you know, it, it's a lot of, um, it's a lot of work, it's time consuming, but it's important work. And it's often a roadmap on what CPD needs to do to reach compliance. So I, you can all read this, but I'll share with you that um, by June 30th of 2023, which is almost one year ago today, or not today, in, in, in a, a month. Oh, in a month. Um, you know, the CPD had reached 86% compliance, preliminary compliance. That means having the right policies. Um, training um, was much lower at 29% and they only had overall compliance and operational compliance with 6% of the paragraphs. But as you can see, it is a progression and you know, it's the balance. People talk about, oh my goodness, they're only in 6% um, compliance and then CPD will say we're in 86% <laughs> compliance. And the truth is, the both is true, right? They're in 86% compliance with the first level of compliance, but they are only in um, compliance with 6%. I hope that you will see at the end of May, as when our report comes out, that those numbers shift a little. And um, I will say it, it is harder. Um, the first level of compliance is, it's not the, I don't wanna say it's the easiest to achieve, but that's where you have to start. So um, it's been five years and they've reached that level. And training is really the next frontier and the goal is you know, full and operational compliance with all of the paragraphs. There's a new training center, um, not far from here, on Chicago mm -hmm. Avenue. I don't know if any of you have been by yeah. it um, or been there. It, it, it's um, pretty interesting and impressive place. 
Um, they still have the academy on Jackson Avenue too because that's how much space they need to truly train people. They probably even need more space than, than even what they currently have. But um, the training is improving and just like um, the policies, the, we monitor the training and is the training the best practices? Is it the best training you can give? But more importantly then, we can read the different um, lesson plans and other things, mm -hmm. but are the training um, officers doing a good job actually giving that training to the um, new officers or to the officers that have been there for a long time that have to repeat the training? And you know, we attend the trainings and um, you know, audit them and other things to make sure that these training officers are doing their job and not you know, editing or going off script, but truly giving the good training that the training academy prepared. Um, some of the achievements of the city during IMR 9 were that they made progress with the interactions with youth and children's policy and a prohibition on sexual misconduct policy. Um, and the CPD um, continued to engage with the community and the coalition and other people about its search warrant policies. Um, the ongoing challenges, my first on my list, and I don't think that the commander actually read my slides before he said it, CPD staffing, which um, affects nearly all the aspects of the consent decree. Um, another thing that, not here in the 15th district, but CPD struggles across the city with um, community engagement and building mm -hmm. trust. Um, we're working on you know, making sure that they are doing high quality and timely training. Um, and then there is a concern that the, um, there is a backlog in the unit that's called TRED, which is the Tactical Review and Evaluation Division, and they review the uses of force. And they, they have a large backlog, and a large part of that is due to number one, <laughs> the problem with CPD staffing. Um, and um, that affects also their progress on analyzing citywide and district-wide data on uses of force. Um, I just wanted to tell you, so I already said, because I didn't follow my um, chart, um, is that IMR 9 is coming out towards the end of the month. And then you will be seeing later in the summer, early fall, our comprehensive assessment part two. Um, the consent decree allowed for the independent monitoring team to review the consent decree and to see if there were um, things that um, we thought needed to be added or changed or if processes weren't working. And so we did an overall um, assessment of all of the paragraphs in IMR 8. And um, the second part will be um, focusing more on some of the things that we think um, potentially could be added or fixed in the consent decree. And then lastly, right now, we have um, the, the our third community survey. It's done every two years. I'm gonna let Joe um, talk a, a little bit more about that. I think it's in the field and almost completed. So Joe, I'll turn it over Actually, it's closed. Okay, yeah, yeah that's, uh, So, um, the paragraph 646 of the consent decree stipulates that the monitor every other year has to do a large comprehensive survey of Chicagoans' perceptions of and experiences with police. And so this is this is the language within the decree, the decree that says a, a scientific survey has to be done, right? Um, and so what we've done is we work with University of Chicago's York office, I don't know if you've ever heard of them, uh, but uh, they do high quality, uh, large scale surveys. And uh, this is a random sample survey of a thousand households in Chicago. Uh, and in our methodology, we've added to that a supplemental sample in addition to thousand ones just mailed out to households old fashioned way. Um, uh, mailed out to households and then folks fill it out online. Um, <clears throat> we added to that a supplemental sample of 300 African American males uh, because that's the population based off CPD's own data that had the highest um, frequent contact with police. And if you want to measure people's experiences, mm -hmm. you want to do that. And then let's be realistic why we have a consent decree. Right. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, let's be you know honest about that. 
and make sure that that population we're including and hearing distinctly in our survey uh, and in our research work. So that's the, the survey, but we also recognize that surveys don't give you the whole picture of everything. Right? They give you those data points in time, but you have to do You have to check things at certain points in time and look at trends. Mm -hmm. And the decree wants to see that trust going up, um, the people's positive experiences going up, and of course, we'll see that in other ways as well, playing out as uh, far as the relationships go. Uh, but as far as our jobs as monitors, we have to do that. You have to get that kind of data. But there's also other ways, and we try to be cognizant of that as well, and to the extent that we can, because uh, this is a massive effort, uh, we try to do focus groups in the years in between the surveys, and anything else that we can learn or, or, or do to learn about um, experiences and perceptions and trust in the community. So, that's, we're doing the third one of those, and that'll give us finally a trend, right? The first time, it's like, okay, well, that's, that's where we are right now. Second time, you're starting to see, okay, well, maybe things were changing this way or that way or not. Third time, if you're seeing a pattern or a trend, right, that tells you something. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you can really start to uh, think about, the rest of the monitoring team can really start to think about what to do with that as well as the community. And I will say that um, our first survey results came pre-COVID. So we do have a, a marker for like pre-COVID versus, you know, pre and pre-George Floyd. So um, that is um, an important indicator for us to mark over time. One of the other things, and I'll go for my third time, cpdmonitoringteam.com, um, you can find those survey results and our report on them. Um, and our, as uh, Joe described, we've done focus groups, um, and we have reports on those focus groups. And we also did a special report after the um, protests and uh, civil unrest in 2020. And as a result of that, you know, we. Um, Provide, we did a report and we worked with CPD on some of the issues that we saw and um, we have been working since then and you know we work even today in preparation for the DNC which I about the DNC coming in so we worked very hard on a uh, First Amendment policy that the coalition also was a part of that community engagement on the First Amendment policy and CPD has been um, very proactively working with us regarding you know the DNC and, and what expectations there could be regarding you know First Amendment um, uh, rallies and other things like that to ensure the safety of both the community and safety officers. And so I would just like to thank you all very much for allowing me to take the time. And um, what would you like us to know about policing in Chicago, or are there questions we could answer? Yes, I, I have a question. Uh, I, I was looking at one of the city, the ongoing challenges of the city is the uh, police officers' suicide prevention yes. initiative. Yes. yes. And uh, I'm a, I'm an ambassador for Bank the Blue. I don't know if you are familiar with uh, Bank the Blue, but what we do is raise money for officers for uh, counseling and. Uh, assisting them with getting through crisis on their own. So uh, it, it's it's kind of like, I, I'm just wondering, could that be like an arm rest also for CPD with one of these uh, challenges to kind of implement? Yeah, I think that that is very important. I've heard of the program, but I don't know oh. as much about it as okay. I should. Okay. And so um, I would love to talk to you more. We'll get your contact sure. information. And, sure. Um, you know, Laura, I know, has worked a lot in, you know, the crisis intervention area and officer wellness. And, you know, I know the commander will tell you that, you know, um, however they lose an officer, Damien, and especially to suicide, is one of the most heart-wrenching and gut-wrenching yeah. things. And it is a very important um, uh, thing to overcome and stigma, you know what I mean? And, and having, you know, um, while the area, what's it officially called, counseling and 
Employee Assistance uh, Program. Employee Assistance Program. Counseling. Yeah, Professional yeah. Counseling. It has, they have, you know, probably <coughs> added uh, 100 percent to the counselors or more but that still only means that there's like 15 mm -hmm. versus you know three or five there, there's but there there should be more there should be more accessibility and really need to get to figure out um also studies on why officers don't want to go is is it mm -hmm. the location it's, it's, is it yeah, the stigma, the stigma. The stigma. It, so sure. should they have the opportunity like you said yeah. where you're providing resources to them if if they outside don't feel comfortable of the outside of it if they yeah. don't feel comfortable right. and it, it's very important there's a stigma uh, in all, overall society okay. that's, that's, that's true um, that's based true. on our uh generational demographic where if you went for counseling yeah. There was something wrong with you. Really? With the youthful, younger generations, it's starting to change. They're, better, right? mm -hmm. uh, they're more receptive. You're starting to see advertisements on TV about getting help. Uh, uh, individuals are starting to acknowledge there are mental health issues and seek either uh, medication or help or professional counseling for that. However, when you look at the, the ages and the number of suicides for law enforcement officers, I would, I would bet that they're trending a little bit older. So obviously we have the inherent issues we have with the stressors of the job and the, as you said, trauma that you see on a daily basis. Physiological trauma of having your heart race up and down when you get the yeah, calls, yeah, yeah. like things that you see, and then your own ability, you know, ability to cope with that. Um, yes. Well, you may take it home and, right. you know, if you don't have any coping mechanism, yeah. so it, it has that effect. So, you know, we, we are a huge supporter of mental health uh, help and assistance uh, on Chicago Police Department as well in the 15th District. So we would love, obviously, if you're trying to make it a structural uh, institution within the department where you can partner and, and you can, they have a, to, to broaden the base, outstanding, or you can come over to 15 with us and you know us, we'll, we'll do our best in order to yeah. help, uh, help that become a, a, a realization for all well, of us. With, with Back to Blue, we do go out and do a resource and tabling and our, our, our funding that we raise is for the entire policeman's family not just the officer and it's it has nothing to do with the police department right. so that that stigma is right. not there well and there's often a concern as you said with older officers will the disaffectors yeah, i should be understood. will i be able to still carry my gun do you know what I mean? yeah. these are right. all yeah. concerns right. that yeah. officers have expressed to us i so. like to say uh the 2021, I was, I always like to say it was a privilege because it was super dope opportunity for me. But I got to teach the police at the academy. I got to teach oh, uh, yeah. their uh, health and wellness and uh, stress resiliency classes uh, that they were conducting. And are those still going on? I, yes, yes, sir. Yes. Yes. It's, yes. Oh, okay, they still do that. Uh, officers are afforded a, uh, a day of resilience. Like okay. They're, they're allowed oh, to take just for resilience. That's great. And also, seek a mental health that's great. Or in order to assist them in health. And we also, uh, courtesy of the consent decree, we have our wellness room slash lactation room in each district. Oh, that is um, so, okay. Okay. Quiet. 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 Yes. Thank and you. And where officers can go and just take a few minutes to themselves in order to decompress. So, uh, okay. tremendous, tremendous work and progress has been made in these areas. And you know, it's a it's a continual uh, motion just to make it better and better, continuous That's improvement. Great. Yep. And I went uh, a year and a half ago. I went to every district. I met with every district commander, and I had them show me their choir. Yes. And so either they fixed it. it up before I got there, or they fixed it up after. I got there. <laughs> <laughs> <And so> Both. <laughs> well, I, 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 I'm, a, I'm a retired uh, Chicago police officer, and I've had two very close friends that were police officers that committed suicide. I'm so sorry, that's lost. how I became uh, involved with the uh, Bank the Blue program. So, and, and seeing that that's something that still hasn't been implemented within the police department just concerned me. That time. But I, I didn't know about the quiet room. Wow. Well, see, well, our professional counseling is an offsite location that uh, officers are made the resource available to them, but it has nothing to, to do, do with the Chicago Police Department. Right. There are no records kept. That's good. The only thing, if if a supervisor is ordered order you to go, let's say pursuant to a critical incident, right? That's it. You know, he went and that's like it. You tell there are no he records kept. Your room. I, I <laughs> as a commander, I can't ask an officer, oh, uh, what happened? What's yeah. happened? Absolutely not. Yeah. So, so oh, there are wonderful. those programs in place. The key is making individuals aware that they're there and making them feel comfortable enough to want to go, but realizing that 
everyone's not going to come. Yeah. Right? Yeah. You know, yeah. you, you can't leave, but, but the pursuit, and that's okay, but the pursuit is to try to put it out there where you know, if you want to go, you're safe to go. Yeah. I will say that it's a lot of the younger guys have been receptive yes. to it. They've even been openly talked about yeah. it and things like that, oh, which I, and yes. I've been on for 23 years, and that was hush-hush for a long time, but I really have Shame seen before. a lot of people take advantage of that, and it's, it's great to see. It really is. And, and they have opened the north side office. These would be just a centrally located office. Now there's the north side office, centrally and south side. Okay. So it does make it much more accessible for Maybe. officers and and you can see, like Serge said, that the, the, the stigma with it has definitely clearly gone down. Yeah, with all because, our training oh yeah, and stuff, sure. I think it really has and, made and, a difference. And, and, and what's been also instrumental in this, uh, professional athletes, you know, who are, who are mm -hmm. supposed to be tough, they're now starting to say, hey, you know, I went to counseling, yeah. I got help. Yeah. And they're saying this publicly, so the messaging in our overall society is starting to change. It is. You know, and it's good, you know, because we can see that development, that progression yeah. of the human condition, that we're getting better. And that and that's the police department, fire department, CTA, doesn't matter who we are, where we go, it, it still affects us all. Yeah. That's good to hear. May I just say that um, the perspective that I'm, I'm speaking is personal. Uh, 31 plus years with the Chicago Fire Department, I'm retired, and my officer, my captain, allowed me to fail forward. This is being recorded, but it, I've got my pension now. I should have been fired. <laughs> Seriously speaking, because of the, the trauma you see, I started drinking on the job because when I closed my eyes, I would still see the images. Mm -hmm. uh, I couldn't go home and whine on my husband's shoulder or tell my family because I didn't want them worried about me. I'm a female and I'm supposed to be emotional, so just imagine how the men felt. They're preoccupied, they come home, they're dealing with a lot of uh, various components of their 24-hour shift. And the brothers in the firehouse is telling me, man up, and I tell them I'm not a man. Uh, but therefore, I see they're having the same effects. So I'm glad to hear that that, that tradition has changed because not only is the suicide rate affected, so it's the divorces, mm -hmm. so it's the marriages and things of that nature. Your children are, are, are getting a part of you. I wore masks for many years. Uh, in the uniform, I came and I robotically worked. Mm -hmm. But when I came home, I basically picked up something just to help me go to sleep. Mm -hmm. And that being stated, uh, there's a Chicago Tribune picture of me at a fire scene. And um, the lady had left the child unattended and in Henry Horners. And she basically said it took us 20 minutes to come from Madison and Levitt to get to Washington and Damon. We knew that's not the case. These are thoroughbreds and stallions that will go through a fire door to get to a fire. And that's just how we work. So um, when she was inciting a crowd, now you know that that parkway was about 75 feet from the street to the building. You have a bunch of sisters and brothers in the fire department uh, about to be um, jumped on by the community because they believe the insightfulness of what she's saying. So the trivial may you turn for more? The Tribune, I need your shoulders. Oh. The Tribune basically sees me doing this and they said that I was consoling her. I was doing nothing of the sort. I was telling her to stop. I was, they didn't, good thing, I don't know where he was because the yellow tape had of 75 feet away, the people away. I was basically telling her, stop telling these people that. You're about to start something that's not necessary. So they wrote it up as the firefighter consoling the woman, I was not. Thank God the camera did not have a mic. I would have quiet. <laughs> so I say that to say that um, allowing officers to fail forward is a great thing, not necessarily of anything um, traumatic or fatal or um, what do you call it, permanent, but just to know that a mishap could be, there could be some form of um, mediation and things of the nature. It doesn't always have to be ending one's career. You know, I was very young, and I'm born and raised West Side. I grew up with four brothers, so I'm my mother's fifth son. I had to learn a different method, so to speak. So that's all I'm sharing with you is that I get it. I absolutely get it. Uh, as a first responder, there's a lot of things we have to unpack in that uniform, and the community would, would best be served if some of those things were just shared because that's why they're throwing all this stuff at you because they're dealing with it, and they're not... Uh, 
in the capacity of a first responder. So that being said, thank you. And I wanted to say this on behalf of 5th District and the officer that we just buried on last week. I pray that everyone gets a chance to enjoy retirement and go home with your family. Thank you. Thank you for your honesty and sharing that with us. Thank you. And that's one reason why we need a call phone. Just like we have a civilian office of police accountability, a civilian office of fire accountability will serve us because we walk in a firehouse and we basically mimic the person and the mentor that's that's in front of us. That's not all good. It really isn't. So that being stated, uh, before I leave this space, we will have a call for Thank you very much. So in interest of time, um, let's you know, take that was the only questions. question Maybe I had. Three. I just wanted to, to know that it sounds good that this uh, police suicide prevention initiative has started. So, And we watch it, and we're making sure that we're uh, getting it done. And so we go around we to all the districts. I'll be in the second district next week. So I go to, to uh, I was in 19, 17. So we go to districts and make sure that they know so that they, they can get their counseling. That's great to hear. Thank yeah. you. Um, any other questions? A quick question. Yeah, Maggie. I heard a name mentioned. You said Steve Rickman. Is he out of Washington, D.C.? He was, yeah. He I know him. With, I know him very well. That's yes, exactly where I know him from. Um, he's still Justice, around. Uh, oh, he's still around. And you know what? God bless Steve Rickman, who is just a wonderful person and has great knowledge and depth Absolutely. of knowledge. He was um, here on a site visit just last month. Really? I wish I would have known. Yeah. Part of the no, I, I got to flip through because I'm, when I heard the name, we 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 used to have collaboration with them back in the 90s. And then he moved to the Department of Homeland Defense uh, when it, security when it started. But Miss Spann and Steve Rigman. Yes. Man. Yeah. Wow. They used to go in. Lucky to have him here. He is um, well into retirement, he told me when he first started working, he's been with us since the very first day. Since we pitched, he came and pitched with us, and he said, I'll get you started, Maggie. And he said recently on a meeting, he said, who knew I'd still be here? Believe it or not, working. the last time we had any collaboration with Steve Wickman was the last DNC. Oh, man, that's great. Oh, that's wild. Uh, you got uh, Atlanta? I see you. Uh, yeah, I had some questions about the accountability and the use of, fraud, uh, of force right now because, and mainly because of this policy that's been proposed to take um, serious disciplinary cases out of the hands of the police board entirely and put them with a private labor arbitration. I should say I'm a union person, I know that process, mm -hmm. and when a worker is accused of shortchanging their employer, you know, absenteeism or, you know, overtime fraud or damaging equipment. I fully support that. But when it comes to violating the human rights of other human beings, um, it troubles me. I wonder, is this in conflict with the consent decree, with what's laid out there? And what role can the you good people uh, monitoring the consent decree have in? Uh, uh, well, it it is in violation of one part of the consent decree, but then another part of the consent decree says that it can't, that the consent decree can't overrule the um, the union contract. Right. Mm. And so we, we don't really have a role wow. in, um, or a voice in like saying it, it's really, it's playing out in the courts. But, but and, I, I, I'm sorry, I'd like, I'd like to add, it's not someone who is accused, it's when, the person is judged that they were guilty. It's the penalty. Do I have a right to an arbitrator, or does, should it go before the police board? Mm -hmm. So it's not a mere accusation. It's one. There's been a determination mm -hmm. of culpability. Mm -hmm. So the police the board would do that part. The police board would make a determination. If it goes before the police board, they would make a determination whether or not separation is is appropriate. Mm -hmm. Whereas an arbitrator may come to a different kind of decision. And these are all pursuant to. I'm sorry. That's okay. No, no, you These are all pursuant to um, the bargaining agreement, the labor agreements between the various labor, various uh, uh, unions as well as the city of Chicago. So obviously, there would be a priority and a decision, and then some revision that would need to come into effect. 
Right. So we don't have the authority because in the consent decree it talks about the labor contracts and we're trying to find the exact paragraph. Okay. So mm -hmm. it, it, it's in the courts. Okay. I, did, I, did. I have, oh. Oh, I just, as you know, I know we have Best City and everything, but when you were talking, you said you've been, been at a PSN meeting and then the commander said, yeah, I was at one yesterday. Like, what Project Safe Neighborhood? Yes. Okay. Project Safe through the Department of Justice? I, I was going to ask that question too. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't make up that acronym. <laughs> Sergeant Brown and myself we generally speak to the at risk youth or older uh, men who have the, they're at a crossroad and mm -hmm. move. They can make decision to accept some services, some mm -hmm. jobs, some help, some apartments, or they could go out and reoffend with uh, gun yeah. Uh, yeah. offenses and be looking at serious topics. Mm -hmm. So uh, we just work with Valerie and our other community service providers in order to do everything we can to ensure that these men make the right choices. Because ultimately they're coming back to the community, right. so we should be there as a safety net should they decide. But, but ultimately it is their choice. They decide. Uh, I have one question, but does anybody else have, we'll take one more, so we can make sure that you all, we got to wrap by eight, but we also will make sure y'all eat. So, any other questions, because I do have one. Okay, um, I just want to look, okay, uh, just, just clarity, uh, for the preliminary compliance, does that mean that uh, CPD creates policies or for because you were saying that it addresses the paragraphs so they create policies to address the paragraphs and then that's what starts the preliminary compliance portion so there are different paragraphs and I was describing not every paragraph has a specific policy mm -hmm. but I was using that as an example because maybe 80 you know a high percentage of the paragraphs require some type of a policy for CBD to have mm -hmm. a policy. Not every paragraph right, does. Right, right, and so right. um, this is getting really nerdy with the data, but we, we have methodologies mm -hmm. on how we review every paragraph. Those are given to the, um, the parties 75 days before a reporting period. And mm -hmm. now they haven't changed that much over time, except if um, we come up with better metrics or CBD is other metrics that we can um, go by. But every paragraph has a methodology on how we are assessing it and I would say you know 75% of the paragraphs start have some type of a policy attached to it and so there might have been already a policy that existed mm -hmm. and if it was you know perfect then they would have started off in preliminary compliance okay. not necessarily okay. but so CPD then submits to the monitoring team and the attorney general those policies we mm -hmm. review them there's a back and forth with us we make comments mm -hmm. and then they cannot post those policies until they've received a no objection notice from both the imt my team and the uh, attorney general's office and okay. so then in that's when it's usually determined then that they have achieved preliminary compliance when they mm -hmm. have a policy that we have reviewed and um gone back and forth and negotiated on. Mm, okay. okay. Um, so I just had two quick things. So, you know, as, I'm sorry. I'm hundreds. So I was just gonna tell you, in the last five years, we've reviewed hundreds of policies. So it's not just, not just the number. It's, it's in our, it's in our There's report. Two examples and on slide 19. Yeah. Okay. But, but we've reviewed hundreds of policies. Mm. It's on the website. <laughs> It's on our cpdmonitoringteam.com. No. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> One time. I said that so you can say it again. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so what I wanted to say was because, you know, there is so much language around consent decree, consent decree, consent decree. So in, in one of our um, webinars, we talked about the consent decree. Mm -hmm. And so we talked about consent decree and consent decree. And so we talked about 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 consent decree learn and so I, I think you know one of the areas that we will start with is community engagement yes, of course. but maybe you know I can talk to you all's office about and give some recommendation because it's, it's an intense document right and we don't want I don't want to overwhelm people but I do want the 15th district to, to have some understanding of what it right. is and what yeah. this language is constantly about and so maybe I can talk to you all about helping me synthesize 
you sure. know, some of those same things and how we'll introduce it. And it's probably going to be virtual. I guess it might have to be a special meeting. Yeah. It's Charlie, you've got that. Yeah, I think, you know, I, I, you know, of course, I'm happy to come to anything, you know, I think it's very well. But also, you know, leaning on uh, Joe and Norma, you know what I mean? Especially if you're leading off with communication, they can be there. Okay. And then, last thing, um, and, this, and I meant to give this acknowledgement after I gave, uh, we did uh, Officer Munoz, but our co counsel here, Dr. Dre. DeAndre yeah. Rudis, he graduated with his PhD oh. from the Chicago School of Professional Psychology with his doctorate in business psychology. So we wow. just want to celebrate him. So I love Dr. Dre. Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> uh, uh, so I actually I graduate June 29th, uh, June 28th, officially graduate. June 29th, though, at the Northwest Austin Council, 5730 West Division, I will be having a accomplishment celebration. It's not just for me because we all accomplish things. So it is community and family oriented. So everybody and, and everybody, yeah, and everybody, well, the police, all you guys, I'll make sure I send a flyer out there so everybody can come. Uh, so with that, uh, it is June 29th at 6 p.m. It starts at 6 p.m. 5730 West Division. Right down from my business. All right. uh, so with that, uh, the last piece on our agenda, we have no motions. I just wanted to make sure that I announced our next regular meeting, which we've moved from June 13th to June 12th. It'll be at 6 p.m. Um, the location is still TBD, but as of now, it'll more than likely be at Moorer Park. Yeah. Um, I just have to make sure I connect with them and uh, talk about it. So if you have an extra chair, bring it. But they did. They I'm talked sad. to the preliminary. Yeah. Yeah. Why you have really done? Because we, we, we will have a, oh we, we will have something in oh, the garden. Yeah, I did. Okay. We so, and, and I did say that about the garden. But the reason we're trying to do it in more park is because we, we want to begin talking about the, that's another acronym, Community Plan for Public Safety. And yes. they're doing this whole block oh, yeah. radius mm -hmm. situation oh, yeah. right Riley Arden and, yeah. and, and okay. Laramie to Laverne from yes. Madison to Monroe. So yeah, yeah we're gonna have someone come from yep. the mayor's mm -hmm. office of community safety okay. yep. to Let's start talk about talking that. about that. The RFP went out awareness. today for, for those uh okay. nonprofits in the room. The RFP went out today. For what? Uh for right. the community's public, public safety, safety plan. plan. <laughs> They, what they are looking for is for organizations to create programming in these specific blocks mm -hmm. that are some of the uh, most the, violent, the most violent, violent blocks in yeah. uh, Austin, Garfield, and Inglewood. Humble, humble, mm -hmm. Humboldt. Okay. Uh, Austin, Humboldt, and Garfield. Okay. So the RFP is online. The RFP it came out today. Uh, so with that. <laughs> okay. With that, listen uh, and. 1944 South Racing. I have extra tickets for a pre Mother's Day soiree. If you're interested, see me afterwards. Now, uh, may I have a motion to adjourn? Yeah, I have a motion to adjourn. These tickets are free. At uh, 755? Mm -hmm. Can I just make a quick announcement? Uh, Let us finish this motion. One second. Okay. Yes, second. Oh, second. I'm sorry. Okay. It has no worries. It has been motioned and second that we adjourn this particular meeting. That being stated, all in favor? Aye. 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 Ayes have it. Hold for the announcement. Okay. Uh, the announcement is that uh, South Austin Neighborhood Association is having a pre memorial observance for uh, veterans to remember and honor them. But this year we decided to remember Mr. William Dale. He was a beat facilitator for beat 15, 13. Mm -hmm. And for many years, he was a member of the American Legion 1932 post, Milton Olive post in 15th district. And he was a photographer for the 15th districts all occasions. He was just a phenomenal guy. Bill and Dale. Bill Dale. And uh, he, he passed away last year. And we want to, this Memorial Day, because he was a U.S. Army veteran, to acknowledge him in the Veterans Peace Garden with a service from his neighbors, his church, and everyone. And it will be May 23rd from 11 till noon for one hour. 
we just want to acknowledge Mr. Uh, William Dale and have the community to come out uh, to acknowledge his family, his church, and his friends for the good work that he did. Outstanding, and those are flyers, right? These are flyers. And see them for the flyers. Thank yes. you, guys. Thank, Thank you. you.